Excellent. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is James Irvin. James is the project administer administrator for the Plan Irwin DNA project. He's done a huge amount of work on uh, Y-DNA projects in the past and has presented on his own project at previous uh, sessions of Genetic Genealogy Ireland. Uh, but he's also done a huge amount of work on GDPR and he has been instrumental in producing <coughs> the interim draft guidelines for ISOG in relation to GDPR. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, James Irwin. Thank you, Morris. Um, is that too loud? It sounds a bit, bit loud. How about that? Um, yeah, lovely. Love to see you all, a few old friends, some new faces. Um, before I forget, the most important thing, I need a bit of feedback from the audience. How many of you are DNA project administrators? A fair more than half, that's good, because I'm aiming principally the first half of my talk to administrators. For those who aren't administrators, I hope I carry you as well, it's certainly not specifically, but um, I'm looking at it primarily from that point of view. I also have to make an apology, I only arrived yesterday afternoon, three o'clock, so I missed the, two, uh, the, the lecture and the panel discussion on this uh, on Friday, but I did manage to watch Barbara's talk at half past six in my hotel bedroom in Perthshire <laughs> yesterday morning and I watched the panel discussion of Friday here in the Clayton Hotel at three o'clock this morning <laughs> and I went to sleep again at five o'clock and got a good night's sleep. <laughs> you to sleep. <laughs> well, no it didn't, but so, so I, I, I hope I can tune in. Unfortunately, I would have made some alterations. Um, my talk, I think, dovetails fairly neatly into following on from from those that uh, I could have perhaps should ask who was here on Friday for the for Barbara's presentation and most good. So this will be a follow-on, a little bit of catch-up, but basically taking the bait a bit further on. So let's get cracking. Um, <clears throat> I'm principally going to talk about GDPR and the, the interim guidance that Morris has mentioned, very much from the genetic genealogy point of view. And then Morris has asked me to spend the second half of my talk on some of the wider issues that were touched on on Friday, taking that a step further on. So the two fit together quite neatly, but the first bit is primarily on the genetic genealogy bit. The second bit is on the wider issues, and in particular, the forensic side of it, which I've had to do some homework on, and I think I can contribute a bit. <clears throat> So I think the first thing we have to digest is that there's all sorts of different types of DNA databases and I wouldn't claim that this is uh, the only way of analysing them. Um, it is original because I didn't find, couldn't find anybody else that had done it before. Certainly different ways of doing it, but the, the way these different types of DNA databases are handled <coughs> is important. We've got to understand the, the difference. Um, direct to consumer tests, it's a, it's a bit of jargon that you have to use, but this is where you, the public pay and you actually pay to do something. The paternity tests were the, the first on the, on the map. France has, has banned them for some time and Germany has recently banned them as well earlier this year. I'd love to know the reason why Germany has banned them. Is this political, something to do with, with, um, with, the, uh, with the EU or is it something that's grown from the Second World War and so forth? I've no idea. Um, then the one we're all familiar with, ancestry and adoptions to some extent. And here, even before GDPR, all the companies selling kits had done a lot to protect privacy. And um, they've had to re-examine it and so forth, but GDPR didn't, didn't come out of the blue. And then there's the health, um, that word health and the road research should be a little to the left, Morris, there's different databases. But you can spend a lot of money, particularly 23andMe, for example, uh, you pay to find out whether you've got a 5% chance of getting leukemia or whatever it is, and, and uh, Morris and I and Debbie have been to a, a presentation where we, the woman stood up, she'd had her whole genome tested, and we saw her personal chance of getting every disease you've ever heard of, um, and she, she'd put herself in public display, which I thought was pretty brave. Um, but it's a completely different world, but it's the same sort of, uh, same basis. And then the medical side, I discovered from some of the homework that Morris persuaded me into, we're all 100% behind DNA databases if it helps with our health, you know, if we've got any kind of cancer. DNA, we, we, there's no need to ask our consent, you know, why didn't they get on with it with the 
even before asking our consent. Whereas if it's res medical research, that's a bit different. You know, is my DNA going to be used for, my family's DNA going to be used for some esoteric thing? And uh, it's a bit like body parts. So what the, what the DNA database is used for it depends very much on how it was collected and so forth. Then there's the more innocent things like ancient DNA and military remains, uh, quite legitimate, but they do raise privacy issues. And then the forensic applications I'll talk on a bit more at length. And then Morris has introduced, quite logically, the mandatory things that Kuwait tried, the Kuwait government tried to introduce legislation that every Kuwaiti and every visitor to Kuwait had their DNA taken, and it failed. China's doing it, not all of China, I gather, just with one province, it may come to all of China. But the UK tried it, Tony Blair decided it'd be a good idea, from an anti-terrorism point of view, that every Brit would have his DNA taken, and it was just killed at birth, political non-starter. I'm not suggesting that it won't come. If it does come, it'll come through the back door. It won't come through legislation saying that everybody in this Western country, France or UK or Ireland, will ma be mandatorily tested. I don't think that'll happen. We may end up all being tested, and that's different. So problems across the board, and they all need different answers. And there's two ways of coming to the answer, and this is all, sort of my conclusion, but I'm putting it at the front so you can see where I'm going. There's legislation that the governments are good at, and there's codes of practice. And this is the point I want to hammer home today, the codes of practice route. They're not mandatory, they're not necessarily effective. It's like the highway code. We all know what the highway code is. It tells you roughly how fast you should go. It doesn't prevent accidents. It doesn't mean that we all adhere to it, but at least there's a set of rules. And if you don't quite adhere to the highway code, you're not necessarily out of involved in an accident or a criminal but it's a behaviour sort of guidance. And this can be done at the international level and the national level, and in America and Germany in particular, at the state level as well. So you can have this whole matrix of different inputs to what the regimes could be. I'll come back to that. Right, now I'm going to start off with this one. It's a very esoteric thing. I never heard of it until I started doing the homework. But two years ago, UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, came up with this, this set of regulations on data protection. And if you look at them, they're not bad. You know, what's wrong with any of that? It's all common sense. We'd all, I think we'd all say, I could live with all of that. This is the United Nations. Um, it's a sort of middle of the road, the principles. And if you once you look at GDPR, you'll see a lot of GDPR actually came from that. Um, so legislators... Have their own, they live in their own world. They like to follow footsteps that other people are doing. And politicians may say, I'm not going to follow that precedent. But the civil servants love being conformists and fitting into a mould and a big sort of establishment. And this is the sort of thing that's in the background. We're not aware of it. I'm not, I certainly wasn't aware of it. I've never heard of anybody talking about it. But it's, it's, if you have that in the back of your mind, you've got a sort of sheet anchor as to where we're going. And the other thing that preceded... GD, um, GDPR, which I'll come to next, is these genetic genealogy standards, which were brought up in 2015 in America. Twelve of the wise and wonderful, I'm sure Barbara, if she'd been around then, would have been on it, that sort of person, plus perhaps. And they came up with a pretty robust set of guidance for handling privacy issues. It's only three pages. I mean, something three pages is pretty good, isn't it, uh, these days? But it's, 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 it's now history, and in fact, it's interesting that ISOG did advocate, uh, um, sorry, sorry, FTDNA did have it in the previous terms and conditions that you had to comply with it, and they dropped it. Not because it's anything wrong with it, but I think it's been overtaken by events. So this isn't criticism, but it's an example at the other end of the spectrum. In one country, um, through lack of initiative elsewhere, they came up with a code of practice. So you've got everything the United Nations at one end, right down to an American set of 12 individuals drawing attention to the problem. And then, Brussels comes along and comes up with this thing. Uh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? <coughs> Here we are. This GDPR, which um, I had never heard of this time a year ago. Is Gerard here? Oh, there he is at the front. <laughs> he said, James, haven't you heard of GDPR? Where have you been? I didn't know what the hell it stood for. GDP is gross domestic... <laughs> product. And that's the way I remember it. And then add an R at the end. And general day, oh God, you know. And then I looked at it when I went home, and it is a nightmare. There it is. It's that much. 
it's, it's just bureau bureaucracy gone mad, so if you're apprehensive that I'm going to tell you this is a good thing, to stop worrying. <laughs> On the other hand, we can't ignore it, and it's that middle road I'm going to try and get over to you. So what is it? Um, well, it, was, it applies in 28 different countries, including the UK, and going down a bit, even if the UK leaves Brexit, we've shot ourselves in the foot in the UK, it will still apply. Uh, so we can leave the politics behind. The objective was quite worthy, it's to protect the EU citizens, their, 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 their private data. Absolutely marvellous concept, nothing wrong with that. And it's now in force, and it has been in force for five months, four months. Um, and a bit like Y2K, those of you who remember Y2K, the end of the turn of the huge apprehension about the world is going to come to an end, anticlimax. And that's what GDPR has been. Not that it was a storm in a teacup, it wasn't a teacup, but it was significant. But the preparation was put in, and to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of any formal complaint, any formal uh, data breach that has occurred anywhere in Europe in the last five months. And I thought there might be some malicious ones, because there's some nasty people out there that like causing trouble, but we haven't even had those, so far as I'm aware. If anybody is aware of an, an incident, an official incident under GDPR, I'd love to hear about it. Well, I, you, you are? Well, the influence of GDPR resulted in Facebook. Ah, no, 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 no. Indirect consequence is enormous. I'll come to that. But actual formal things, no. So it's in force. Now, it's, it's a funny bit of legislation. A lot of stuff that comes out of Brussels, forgive the, the slang, the, the paperwork that is produced by the uh, leaders in Brussels, um, it comes out as directives and it has to go through the national parliaments before it comes law. GDPR isn't like that. It came into force regardless for all 28 countries on the 25th of May. And Ireland was very sensible. They said that's the end of it. They have the Irish uh, Dale, is it? Dog. Dog. Didn't, didn't have to even discuss it. it it's now Irish law. Okay, right. Well, I stand corrected in that case, but it went through with a rubber stamping thing. Uh, it was a page or two long, that sort of thing? It didn't go through rubber stamping. It took, uh, it passed through the hands of the Irish Trust. It took about nine to ten months. Oh. And it was also given, it was the same enactment gave expression to the okay. uh, of directive of yeah. the EU. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. I, well, I stand corrected in that case. So, um, I'm not an expert. I'm just preaching of sort of one, half a jump ahead of you. Um, but I imagine it was just a two or three pages and a, a little bit about the implementation. Big, thick? Oh, right, okay. Well, the other end, perhaps like the UK. The UK one makes look, that look like a kindergarten thing. The UK one is about much, over twice as thick. And it is impenetrable to read. It's written by civil servants who have kept themselves in a job for a a lifetime because it all refers to subsection C paragraph D do this and if this applies you go to subsection 42 paragraph 14 and if that doesn't apply then you go to regulation 4 part 6 part 3 oh god and if you've got it online it's not too bad because you can tick it but if you've got it hard copy it's you know it really is hopeless and it doesn't at the end of the day it doesn't add anything to the genetic genealogy problems so you've got all this water paper, and in fact, we're lucky that it hasn't addressed it, because it would just make life even more complicated. Um, so we've got 88 pages. It's divided into recitals and articles. So that's the recitals, and that's the articles. So it's a bit of jargon. And you'll see that um, I've got superscripts and subscripts, so you can actually, not today, but subsequently, if you wanted to, you could refer to what I'm talking about. Um, now, the first thing is that its primarily, primary attention is to focus on individuals, not on admins or companies or Facebooks or everything, the rights of the individual. That's what it's basically about. And it's basically good news. It gives you seven statutory rights. All of us here, if we live in the, in the European Union, we have these rights by, look, by statute law. They're not common law. They're not paragraph 42 or something that was done here and all the rest of it. This is now the law right across. So it's got to be transparent, lawful, and all the rest of it. Um, consent is absolutely critical. We'll come to later on in the talk where consent isn't involved, but it's got to be, it's got to be, each person has the right to withhold consent, and if they've given consent, to withdraw it. 
absolutely fundamental. And there's all sorts of small print about the internet. Right to be informed, right to access, rectification, the right to be forgotten. So if you want to want to get out, you've got a whole your whole paper trail or, or electronic trail has got to be erased. That's the literal interpretation. Well, we all know perfectly well you can't rewrite what's gone on the web. It's it's it's, it's there forevermore. And there's a there's a there's a a Google page I find recently way back. So if you want to know what Facebook was saying two years ago on something, there's a fair chance you can go and find it. Um, even a man in the street, you don't need to get into the black web, the dark web or anything to find it, it's there. Everything that's on the web is there in perpetuity, almost certainly, perhaps not literally, but so you can't kill it. So there's a conflict in the reality and the law. I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, the right, and the right, the most important one is the right to complain direct to the supervisory authority. So if I, as a private member of a, of a genetic um, uh, project group, don't like the admin and I'm all causing trouble, I just write a two-liner to the ICO in, in, uh, in London and in theory, I don't think it would happen in practice, but in theory, the, the ICO would write to me and ask me to explain myself as a, sorry, write to the project admin and ask them to explain themselves. So it's, it's a nasty tool. It hasn't been used and I think people have got more common sense, thank heavens. But in theory, if you're administ if you're, even if you're storing the DNA, um, you, you're, you're caught by this, this um, new regulation. Some people interpret it differently. I'll come to that in a minute. <coughs> now, um, Morris has asked me to put this one in, that's why I've, I've stumbled a bit. In addition to all the things that, that we're talking about, the statutory rights, if you're really worried, there, you can do other things. Um, the companies have done a fair number of things, the most important of which, of course, is to give you a number, a kit number instead of your name, so your, your results are posted either privately or publicly, but without your name or your email address. And you can ask your project admin, or as an admin, um, you don't share email addresses, and there is a convenience that the matches include the email address and as administrator you can say, well that means that I can, all those matches I can put them in touch with each other and I personally have never done that. I've said if you want to talk to one of your matches, do it through me and I'll forward the email rather than give the email address without their permission. Um, and you, of course you can do what many admins do, not do any more than what FTDNA give you, not go to public. My project, I do go public. I take on a lot more risks now. I'm learning to live with it and to manage it, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it, it doesn't stop it, but it's one way of extra purpose. And as an individual, um, you can not tick these boxes that FTD and I give you about sharing, about access to the, of the administrators to your data. Um, many of us use the, our kit number as our password to get into our FTDNA page. I think it's by default, is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You can change it. And of course, if you are using a kit number and somebody really wants to, to uh, dig into your page, it's the obvious place to start. Um, you can use a false name. I've got some people in my project who, who have deliberately given a false name. And I don't, I don't think I know their true name, but they've given a false name. Or another one is I've got quite a few people in my project that use my email address on the FTDNA databank. I wanted their, their uh, DNA. They didn't want to reveal their email address to FTDNA, so it goes through me. So I'm their contact point. I could abuse that, but they trust me. And having taken that trust, then I'm not going to, in no way am I going to tell anybody. I sometimes get around it rather circuitously, but I certainly don't give them the email address. Like the chief of the clan, for example, he doesn't want 15 people ringing him up saying, you know, I think I'm your 14th cousin. So that all goes through me. And, and they get pushed back. As I say, I want to see your family tree, and they send it. And I say, well, if you go back there, I can show you exactly where you've gone wrong. It's an old fable that you've all inherited. You thought it was gospel, it was rubbish. And the other one you can do is to not join JEDCOM or JEDMATCH. Now, Barbara is going to stand up and say, for Christ's sake, scrub that. And I, I personally don't use JEDCOM or JEDMATCH, but I've got nothing against them. And we've heard how terrifically advantageous they can be in a societal sense uh, in the forensic application. But if you're really worried, then don't go down that route. Um, it's a step you can take. Now the definitions are, this is where it gets tricky, because GDPR tries very hard to be very specific, but it fails miserably in the objective. So what is personal data? 
Well, it's, it's the data that relates to the project member in our case. And the first thing is it doesn't apply to dead people. It says this categorically, FT, um, GDPR does not apply to dead people. So all our family trees, provided you get rid of the, the bottom line, metaphorically, um, that's all fine, it's not covered by GDPR, which means a lot of our genealogical stuff is fine. On the other hand, if you are running a one-name study that's done a lot of bottom-up research, then it's all key on living people and it's a bit more difficult. What is genetic data? Well, it's not quite clear, um, but uh, they do, they are very worried about genetic data. They call it a special category and they've got, a, in theory, an extra layer of, of concern about it. Um, but it's, the wording is sort of, at face value, it's, it's okay, but when you go into it, it's a bit iffy. You know, when you get onto the physiology and health side of it. This awful word, pseudonymization, something like that, you can read it. Um, and it wasn't clear, but that's, all that is, is giving the kit number in practice. And FTDNA have confirmed that, that's what they interpreted it as. So we've got round all that already before GDP card came along. So there's nothing new in that. Processing, this is, this is the tricky one. Processing includes the storage of data. So everything you have on your laptop, even if you don't give it to anybody, you are processing the personal data of somebody, if he lives in the, in the European Union, who comes under this. So even if you don't use it, you are actually caught. There's some exceptions we'll come to in a second, but, but that's where you start from. Um, and then the processing be, may be done by one of three groups, controllers, and their FTDNA and Her my heritage are obviously controllers. Processors, which is a very vague, but one of the bits I picked up was you're a contractor to the controller, and we don't have a formal contract, so I think we wriggle out there, um, but it's a bit iffy. And then there's third parties, what an awful term. But it says under the direct authority of the controller, and if you read the new terms and conditions of FTDNA, they say admins are under their direct authority to, to run their projects. So the wording is now back to back. That doesn't mean the lawyers would, would, would buy it, but at least prima facie there is a link there that we can hang on that. Um, and it, it, it's back to back. And then there's this business about consent, being freely given, and, and do you really understand it? And, and this morning we heard of an example that, you know, it's not just your consent, you're not just committing yourself, but it's your whole family because they're sharing your DNA. And are you authorised to speak on their behalf? If you've got a troublesome brother, you know, uh, should you ask him before you do it? it it's a very grey area. And then the supervisory authority, that's just jargon for the government agency in the country you live in. Um, so it's all got to be translated. Uh, um, the applicability to administrators, um, this is the extraterritorial thing, it, it applies right around the world. So if you're an American um, member of a, no, if you're an American um, administrator and of a project and you have European members, which of course is the vast majority of FTDNA's projects, then in theory GDPR applies. How they would enforce it, we don't know. There is a case, apparently, I learned of the UK government, the ICO is the UK supervisory authority, is now trying to fine an American company for a breach on some, nothing to do with genetics, something in the medical field. They've imposed a fine, but whether the American company will choose to pay the fine and what the British authority will do if they don't pay, we don't know. Um, it's, it's a very complex area. Um, and we're, in particular DNA they're worried about and the consent sort of thing, but there are exceptions. And one of them is, in the small print, it says GDPR doesn't apply in the course it, activities involved by an individual in purely personal or household activities with no connection to a commercial authority. Now, there's two ways of interpreting that, and we don't know which is right and which isn't. And in fact, I'm sure if you asked any authority, they wouldn't know either. But does it mean we shouldn't be processing data when we're charging the customers, our members, for money? Of course, we're not doing that. One or two people get on the fringe of it, Morris. You charge people occasionally. Oh, the work you do? Professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then, then you can't, you, you def obviously do have a commercial involvement and you can't declare excuse. On the other hand, I interpret it on a more precautionary way that all the consents that we as administrators are working from arise from a commercial activity between FTDA, FTDNA and its customer. 
Now that's an ultra cautious interpretation, and in fact, the practical answer, it doesn't make any difference, but I would rather not incur the risk of me being wrong on that, uh, and assuming I can put two fingers to the whole thing, to put it crudely and in excess, because I'm not suggesting people take that interpret and treat it that way, but there's a grey area that we will, won't get clarity on for, for years. Um, and it will depend on each individual project. So one project um, will, will be in one camp and another project will be another, depending on how deep they are. And the Irish government may decide they're going to interpret it this way and the German government may, may interpret it that way. So there's a huge quagmire ahead if we are not respectful of the, the underlying principles. This is a complicated table, I won't show you, but there's five different ways you can interpret these things. And the red box is, is the ones we want to avoid. Joint controller and processor, FTDNA would have to, would have to be party to a legal contract uh, with us as administrators, and I can't see them touching that with a barge pole. So to go down that route is difficult. If we say we're controllers, we're holier than thou, even more cautious than I am, and sometimes I am being a controller, then you take on a whole roll of extra responsibilities and you're going to be in, uh, can I say deep shit? But, but you're liable to be in more trouble. So one of the first two, and in fact you'll see the small print of what you have to comply with, whether you go for the first one or the second one, it doesn't make a lot of difference. It would be nice to know which category you're in, but in practice, provided you adhere to the, the few things you have to do as a, as a third party, it's not very different to what you do if you decided you, you had no commercial involvement. James, we're live on Facebook. Oh, well, I'm on Facebook. I think Facebook is rather thick enough skin to not to be worried about the likes of me. Now, the sanctions if you go wrong. Compensation. So if, you, if, you, if you're caught under this and, and, and um, you're found guilty in, in, in inverted commas, you're liable for making good all the damages you've caused. And they could be extensive. For a project administrator, probably pretty negligible, but of course, if you're Facebook, they could be. And on top of that, 4% of your total worldwide turnover. Now this is what worried ancestry and FTDNA. This is why we have layers and layers and layers of small print now in our relationship with these testing companies. They've got to protect themselves against 4% of their world turnover. It is scary. For them it is very real. And it took FTDNA some time for the penny to drop, just the extent of their potential exposure. I don't think in practice they'd ever get anywhere near that. They're not stupid. Uh, the, the authorities aren't uh, going to be that zealous. But, the, but the, the, the threat is there. And then there's something called penalties, which arise in the case of a disproportionate burden on a natural person. Now, in family history, a natural person, I was brought up in Scotland, that's an illegitimate person. Um, but here it is, you and me, a natural person is a human and individual um, that lives in the EU. And we are liable to get a reproduction. This is UK language, not... not um, GDPR language, a reprimand or a corrective order. In other words, you're at school, you misbehave, you get a rap on the knuckles and a bit of detention and don't do it again. And that's the world we're living in, in practice, I think, if things go wrong, if you're sensible. If you say, I don't think the law applies to me, they'll start ratcheting up. But if you can show you've, you've gone along with it, um, this is the sort of sanction we're going to get. The ICO website, and I thank Debbie for this, you read it carefully, they've got a very extensive website. They're very keen on a soft approach. Their wording, carrot and stick. They're a lot of carrot. Please conform with the law. Please be sensible and all the rest of it. That's what they're effectively saying. If you're silly, we'll jump on you. It turns out, I think, the resources for jumping are getting fairly... It's, it's anecdotal, but I hear a lot of their staff have left because they get better, better salaries with commercial companies as a data protection officer than they're paid to be a, a policeman in the ICO. How true that is, I don't know. I have to be careful how I put it. Um, but there is an element of that. It's like the speed cameras, you know, with no film in them. Uh, I think there's an element of that. But I don't want to trust that. I want to, I want to, be, I want to keep within the speed limit, roughly. I'm not aware of any sanctions arriving in the last five months. So, you know, the, the, it was a storm in a teacup, but it was a real teacup. It wasn't a, an imaginary teacup. Uh, if you do get in trouble, I am happy to try to help uh, privately, but, but it, it could be. It's going to be the... It's going to be the I mean, I, I gather if you write to ICO and ask for some help on a, on a technical issue, it's two months before you get a reply. They're short staff. They've, they've got to think of the precedents they set. They've got to go through the lawyers before they reply. So a dialogue is going to take years to sort out. 
and you're going to live this with this every time you go to bed. And am I is the post tomorrow morning going to going to worry me? That's the sort of threat that I'm worried about. Unfortunately, in America, and I'm generalising, they've taken a different view. Because when you interpret the law in America, you look at the letter of what is said. You don't look at the spirit behind it, what the objective was, so much. And if you look at it in an American context, then this really is scary. And that's why we've seen some pretty Herculean consequences. Um, so looking at it from an ISOG point of view, four things we had to do uh, as, as members of ISOG to help Catherine. Um, we had to look at ISOG's ex its own exposure. And that was largely an American issue. And eventually I left it to Catherine's American advisors to look after that. I think it's been done probably satisfactorily. I put a lot of pressure, or we put a lot of pressure on FTDNA to, to get on with it. They were a bit slow on the uptake. Um, to minimise, from our point of view, the risk of complaints, because it's the complaints and the data breaches that will trigger consequences. And if they could do anything to minimise themselves getting in trouble, it would be to our benefit. I, it's not my job to write their small print, far from it. Um, even though there's a little bit of that as well, but that's by the by. Um, and then for individual members, of course, we've got to respect their rights. Um, I saw has got to say. But for the project administrators caught in some of this grey area, um, I felt and I put together a study group of whom most of the members are here, Gerard, Debbie, Morris, um, Catherine, and we've got a couple of others um, who should come to my mind immediately, but I'm... <laughs> there weren't many others. <laughs> But we put together a little working group and came up with some, some guidance, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm already running out of time, I think. Let's crack on. Uh, so we put this group together. We published in March, which was a bit before other hand. It's a sort of middle-of-the-road approach. Um, it's on the web. Um, it hasn't come under any criticism, one or two private <coughs> questions, but it's, it's survived four months without any criticisms. Um, it's been endorsed by FTDNA, and we didn't ask for their support, but they volunteered to endorse it. It complies with the best practices thing I'll be talking about in a minute, and it's, it's now gone six months without criticism. That doesn't mean we've got it right, but it suggests we haven't got it completely wrong. Um, so it comprises this, this interim guidance, and it's very well that it was worded interim guidance, because it'll be, I thought it would take a few weeks, it's actually going to take several months before we can move to something beyond the interim. We've got to digest the consequence a bit more. The list of don'ts, I'll go through the list of do's, uh, a privacy statement, and then actions in case of things going wrong. Um, and if you have a public website, then there's some additional precautions you have to take as well. So the don'ts. Now the first four there, I'm not going to go through. We wouldn't do them at any rate. They're supplied before GDPR. Nothing new there. But now, if we do get a query from a member, if we're going to be in the side of the angels, we've got to reply within a month. Now, that's pretty easy, isn't it? But of course, on the other hand, if you're going on a six-week holiday um, and you haven't sort of delegated this to your admin, it's getting a bit grey. But I'm not going to lose sleep over that. But this is, this is the sort of thing that you begin to have to worry about a little bit. One thing I had to do, I've got a database, and I had all my email addresses alongside in the same database as all my DNA data, the kit number in the middle was the link. Now, if I pressed the wrong button, I could transmit that to all my members. And that, of course, was a risk that, thank God, I never got caught on, but I sometimes sweated over it. Now I keep them separately, so I don't accidentally broadcast all my members' email addresses to everybody else. And that's a sensible precaution. It's a bit inconvenient um, from the way I was, but um, that's the sort of practical thing that, uh, that, that it hints fairly clearly that you shouldn't do. And if they ask to be removed from your, from your project, then you've got to remove the data. I'll come back to how you interpret that in a minute. Um, and just bear in mind that what you may have worked out what you think is right and proper now, but in six months' time it may be history. These things aren't standing still. There will be precedents that come up that we may have to react to. What you do do, again, there's some, some fairly obvious things. It's not very difficult. But you should tell your members what data you're holding, why you're holding them. And you can do this in a woolly way, just saying, I'm, doing, I'm holding your data so I can comply with the goals of the project. It's a sort of circular argument, but in, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and sound, spend a mountain about it. Spend a, make a mountain out of a molehill. Um, you've got to keep it up to date and so forth. Um, your database should have password protection. Common sense. Most of us have it built in at any rate. So if you leave your laptop lying around downstairs, 
and somebody picks it up and so, spots your emails, haha, I get that one, and there's no password, you've been negligent. If your password is, is Johnny123, you've not been quite so negligent. If it's five digits long, or you know, five miles long, you've been very careful. But of course, you know, we live in the real world and we all forget our passwords. So just common sense applies. Uh, but the big thing is, and this I would stress, every project admin now should have a privacy statement. It doesn't have to be very long, it doesn't have to be very detailed, but if you do get caught, you can say, this is my privacy statement. When I wrote it, it was the best I, th I could think of. I tried to adhere to it, and I'm sure the authorities will then say, if, if, they, if you're caught in a complaint, okay, well, that was what you did there. Now you will think about this. So you've taken a step in the right direction. It's an insurance policy, minimum premium. This is an example of a, of a second edition. That This is a slightly better one of, than what appears on the web. I'm very happy to take photographs of it. I now use that one on my private website. It's a bit more sophisticated in detail than the ones in the, in the interim guidance. And when we come to a, a next generation, elements of that will be in the next one. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but it's just reiterating what was in the first two the two previous slides. But the point is, it's an undertaking by you as the administrator and your co-admins that you will do this, and it's signed off by you and your co-admins with your name and email address and their email and address. And they've got to buy into that before you, you publish it. It's the undertaking, it's the contract you make with your members. Uh, so conceptually, it's very important. The detail is much less important. Um, but you, you should be tackling that sort of issue. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit. It's a personal hobby horse of mine. Um, I run a public, a secondary website, to use FTDNA's wording, and I've now got to take very careful extra precautions because I publish all my members' data, and they've got to tick. I've got to make sure that the box is ticked, opt into sharing. Now, if you look at my website at the minute, I haven't quite got there, but in a few weeks' time, I will have got there. It's it's a very difficult level to achieve. Um, but uh, the benefits of doing this are much greater than I'd appreciated. I run a big project with a small, not particularly prominent surname. I've never understood how I got so many members because I don't go proactively recruiting them. I now realize the reason I've got so many members is it's a fully public website integrated in my discussion of how it, how it works and all its process. It's not dependent on the FTDNA format and navigation or rest of it and it's, it's much more transparent, and I think that's how it succeeded. But it's high, in today's environment, it's higher risk, and I think if Mike Milligan was here, he'd say, James, be very careful. So the swings and roundabouts, coming back, the underlying premise is the compromise between accessibility and privacy. And if you don't want to go down this route, that's absolutely fine, but I am still determined to go down this route, and uh, we'll see in five years' time whether I was uh, justified. But you, it takes a lot more work, and you've got to update it regularly. I've always done both. Um, now, if things go wrong, there's three things that can go wrong under GDPR. A complaint, somebody in our context, a member complains against you as an administrator. Or they can ask for data, or you can make a mistake. Like I give a potential example, you can publish all your, all your uh, email addresses, your member's email address. Or you can lose your laptop, or it can be stolen. That's a data breach. You know, if somebody wants to spend the time, they're going to crack it and get into all the data. Now, if that happens and you call yourself a controller, you've got to tell your supervisory authority within 72 hours you've lost your laptop. And anybody who volunteers to be a controller has opened the noose for that pitfall. You lose your laptop, you're going to be in administrative trouble at least. So to me, calling yourself a controller is mad. If you're an American lawyer, you take, come up with a different answer. How can you wriggle out of it? Because you are, you are proactively playing with data the way you do it, the way I do it. Um, but thankfully, I don't think that's what's going to apply in Europe. That's where we have a, a dichotomy. I mean, if you're an American lawyer on the defense side, of course, you'd argue the opposite. So it's not every American lawyer would argue that. But the, that's the level they look at it. I think in Europe, we take a slightly more benign approach to it. So this is why I'm much keener on the third party interpretation, which actually doesn't address these problems in the first place. So if the law doesn't address it, you didn't worry. Right, what's going to happen in the future? Um, ICO, the UK Supervisory Authority, have promised us a newsletter on DNA and pseudonymization. They've just done one on exemptions, and frankly, 
Oh, I mean, what an anticlimax. It's four pages of waffle. They've just requoted GDPR backwards, forwards, inside, upside down, at, at a sort of even sub university level. A, 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 a high school student could have written the thing. It is pathetic. I'm on air. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, it doesn't, in other words, if you ask for guidance, you're not going to get it. Um, and I'm going to skip, skip the rest of it, you've read it, um, because I want to get on to the next bit and I'm running way behind. That, this one, first line I gather is wrong, thank you very much for, for your correction. UK, I think I've talked about this, Germany, much more stringent, and the USA, they're coming up with a completely different interpretation. Okay, what happened elsewhere? Now, if you can read that first paragraph, it's thanks to our chairman. But these are some of the, of the casualties of, FDD, of GDPR already. Um, we've lost Y-Search, we've lost MitoSearch, um, we've lost access to journals. I even hear at the back this morning that you can, can no longer get the New York Times online in Ireland. Um, I wasn't aware of that, but this is one of the consequences of GDPR. It's way over the top. That was never the intention of anybody in Brussels for that sort of thing to happen. But that's the way the ultra-cautious have interpreted it the other side of the Atlantic. Not every newspaper, I suspect, but that's the way it appears. The New York Times and several others have done it. Um, most of the companies came up with new, new, new uh, material. Um, Morris, I'm going to run till half past, if you don't mind. That's okay. Yeah, um, so that gives me enough in 10 minutes. But I'm still going to rattle on. And particularly Jedcom and Jedmatch have, have tightened up their procedures considerably because they are actually more exposed because they're sharing data in a, in a more public forum than the testing companies. So they've, they've, they've all upped their ante with small print. Sorry, James, what do you mean by Jedcom? Yeah, I was wondering that. Is that DNA in Jedcom? Sorry? What's Jedcom? Jedcom is when you share your ancestry trees, isn't it? Yeah, but Jedcom is the file. The file. The file. The file. It's but company. it's not a company. But it's got a, it's got a website that has a privacy statement in it. That's DNA Jedcom. Sorry, D I meant DNA Jedcom. Oh, Beg your okay. pardon. Sorry, no, I do mean GNA. I'm not familiar with that with that uh, activity. That's why I've got it slightly wrong. Thank you for pointing that out, Debbie. Mis another mistake. Fair enough. Good point. Um, now, there's a think tank in Washington, um, advocacy, or we, we, we here would call it, um, uh, what do you call it? Another word, we use another word for advocacy. It's got membership of a lot of big companies, so, you know, what is it? Is it really worth it? Facebook are members, and, and Ancestry and, and um, 23andMe, not FTDNA, I suspect because they just haven't got the resources to indulge in this sort of thing, and it's in Washington and they're in Houston, but it's probably something like that. But they've come out with a 19-page a document, a code of practice, which is actually, when you look at it, it's very good. It's quite recent, it only came out in July, which is sort of, you know, way post FTDNA, but it takes account of FTDNA. And they are saying, um, for example, that all these companies have signed up to Code of Practice that the data shouldn't be shared for purposes other than that was collected. Now, you can immediately snigger and say some of these big companies are not abiding by that at all. But the senior management has said that's where they want to go, and that's a, surely a step in the right direction. But it's a code of practice, so of course you can, everybody can break codes of practice, it's only pointing in the direction. And the other technical thing is that they've come up with this question of deletion, and I think it's very interesting. They're recognising in, on paper that when somebody wants to leave a project, you can delete them from the, the current paper, you can stop researching them, but it's saying you can't get rid of the paper trail completely, what you must do is, is prevent access to it. So you don't have to destroy all, all your old backup files, um, and, and hard, hard, core, hard um, drives that you kept, kept somewhere when you ditched your old computer um, because technically it's too difficult. Now this is only their interpretation but it's the most intelligent interpretation of this right to be forgotten that I've seen and if it ever comes up I think we can say well if that's what all these companies are saying why do you expect little me to do more? Right, going on a bit from the genetic genealogy to the wider issues um, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, um, these were uh, my summary of the, the two tests that Morris introduced before the discussion on Friday. I put them into two halves, the, the police uh, ones and then the other ones, um, and you'll see that all of them, with the exception of non-violent crime, are way over 50%. So the, the goodwill for let's, let's restrict data, the, most of the population is saying this is a good idea. 
Um, another example of this, and this isn't a poll, but this is what is actually happening on actually in the, in the context of, of, um, of some other aspects that we haven't been talking about within America. 15% of the American states um, prohibit discrimination in long-term care insurance. And if you go through the list right up to health insurance, 94% of the states have laws saying that, for example, our, gene our genetic genealogy, DNA, can't be used for health insurance purposes. And that's the actual law, but the discrepancies between state by state is, is considerable. So we can't say that American states prohibit this or don't prohibit that. They're all different, and the matrix of, of it all isn't, isn't clear, and I'm sure in, in a year's time those numbers will all change as they all try to ca play catch-up and all the rest of it. There's also Gina in America, which I think is the federal level, is it? Yes, and this, this, uh, this example is just looking at a few at state level. The federal level is, is even more fuzzy. They've got some laws, but they haven't got others, I think. Um, GDPR, on the other hand, is very clear. You cannot use, under GDPR law in Europe, Data cannot, personal data cannot be used for the purpose other than which it was connected, collected without consent or if the legal, if the police come along, there's that letter. And that's what I want to come on to next. So I've talked about the ones in, in orange and red, and you can see in black there are other ones I could talk about. I'm not going to spend the time on it. It's a real fog of, of, um, of different regulations and codes of practice. But what I wanted to get over with this slide is that there's an awful lot of work being done. So when Donna made the point on Friday, she didn't know what the law was, what the, what the policy was. Of course she did. None of us have, have got our finger on that lot. And even with a, quite a bit of homework, I wouldn't claim to be master of it. It's a very complex thing. But it's not nothing. A lot of work is being done to try and coordinate these, uh, these things. Right, going into the frenzy, there's another initiative that's been taken. This one is much bigger. Um, by uh, various sort of mid-level organizations in the top line to address the imbalance between, and this is on the forensic side now I'm moving on to, between individual rights and law enforcement. And they, they deliberately state there's a middle ground between, on the one hand, the needs of, of the criminal uh, regime to protect ourselves as citizens, and the other, the pri private rights. And they produce this um, code of practice um, from which I've got this slide, that's why I put it first. You can see the world is already pretty well covered by legislation on the use of forensic, use of, of uh, DNA data, forensic uh, databases. It got China down here as planning. China by 2017 was well past the planning stage. India wasn't even mentioned, but India in fact is, is in there as well. So there's a huge amount going on already. Um, the growth of forensic databases, um, here you can see what, what is happening in China. But the point I want to bring out here is, look at the UK, the blue one at the bottom. They took a dip in 2013. It's almost been lost, but this is when it was decided by, uh, there's a law case that the police couldn't keep databases for cases that were, data for cases that were dead. If you'd, if you'd been convicted and you'd served your sentence, I'm not sure the small print, but if there was no reason to keep the data, the police had to destroy it. They were loath to destroy it, and they didn't destroy very much by the look of it. But that's the reason for the dip, and, and it's creeping back up again. But those curves are going to go, go on rising, no matter what the legislators say, I'm sure. So the, the FGPI, whatever it stood for, I've already forgotten, it's a 110-page report. It really is superb. It is, it is, if you're interested in the subject, this is the, the, the Bible, I think. Um, it's a response to the public concern. It, they've monitored 132 countries and they've come up with examples of good practices from all these countries I've listed. Even Russia, they find an example of good practice. Now, whether the Russians follow good practice, given recent political developments, is a different matter, but they have actually got legislation through the Russian Duma um, that protects individuals' privacy. It's just a small, small example. So this, this thing has picked out what the, the angels should do if they're drafting forensic uh, rule, rules for forensic application in a, in a country. And civil servants love this sort of thing. You've got to get into the framework of their mentality. If other people are doing it and it looks right, they'll do it as well. So there's a lot going on in the right direction. Um, this is my last slide, apart from the summary. This is some of the questions that you can get. If you ask these questions, some of the answers. Like, who should collect the data for a forensic? And it actually says it shouldn't be the police. It should be a specialist agency. 
Now, in America and UK, to tell the police that they're not trustworthy enough to collect DNA isn't going to wash. But if you're in, in some of the African countries where the reputation of the police is zero, you know, DNA is going to, is going to take the thing backwards. So this is quite, a, quite, a, quite an altruistic um, set of things. But some of the questions we've been asking, you would ask, there are, there are some answers that they're beginning to identify the best practice to follow. I'm not suggesting that every country will adopt these in two years or even ten years. And even if they're adopted, they will be observed. But the idea of getting a middle ground that is explicit and, and spelt out in some detail, the work is already going on. So th this was to try and give you some reassurance of the questions that were coming up in the seminar on Friday, that in fact answers are in the pipeline. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it's all going to happen and sort itself out tomorrow or anything like that. Um, but, but at least work is being done at a high level to protect our in, inter, or to, to, to resolve the conflict between what we want as private individuals and what we want as citizens that are going to be protected by the police. Summary, in other words, um, basically, as on the genetic side, we want something in the middle of the road. We've got to pay respect GDPR, but we needn't go over the top. Um, it's turned out to be a big anticlimax. We see the side effects every day. We go on the web. Are you going to click these cookies? That's, that's GDPR. But for us as geneticists, provided we're sensible and have a, a privacy statement, um, it's really turned out to be a, a non-event. On the forensic side, it is expanding rapidly. We're quite white to be worried. But I think the, the legislative progress is probably going to be roughly in the right direction. There'll be exceptions, of course, um, uh, in every regime. They're not going to all get it right first time. But the, the momentum is in that direction. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, I think it's very reassuring that uh, we have somebody like you who's able to go through all of this information and come up with uh, this type of reassuring message. Um, some of the, I'm sure there's going to be questions for James, but I'm going to hold them back for the panel discussion that follows now. So we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to come back for a panel discussion that looks at DNA, privacy and data protection in general, and most importantly, how you as an individual can optimize your privacy and data protection when you're dealing with recreational DNA testing and the commercial companies that we all test with. So take a five minute break, but before that, please give James a very big thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the circulation two minutes ago when I'm not halfway through it. That was a bit less. Yes. Well, I know. I thought it was that's your receipt. I thought it was important that you know where you stood. Well, yeah, and I, we, we hadn't talked about it. I had actually.